Happy Sunday, everyone. It's about noontime, October 18th. I got Fassel on the call here with me today. We are going to talk about the market recap from last week and what we should be looking forward to for the week ahead, as well as going into the election time. Some of our topics to discuss today are S&P 500 growth versus value stocks, or just in general, growth versus value stocks. How has there have been a new reality in the markets and how we should be contending and dealing with that going into the next phase, the next decade ahead. How has valuations changed? Um, are FANG stocks really expensive? Are they a bubble? How is Apple trading relative to Microsoft in the 2000 bubble? And then we'll talk a little bit about bonds and the Dixie by the end of this uh, video. But, you know, without further ado, I'm going to bring Fassel on and, you know, get this video started. Welcome, Fassel. Oh, uh, thank you for that nice introduction. Happy to be here. How are you doing? Fantastic, man. You know, uh, last to cover, you and I were talking about, you know, this, this new paradigm, new reality. I figure let's just kick it off from there. You know, the question really lies, um, you know, within the, the, way we look at markets is have things changed and, and are we ever going back to the way we look at markets pre-corona? Um, you know, what are, what are your thoughts on that? It's amazing. I would like, it's such a great question. Cause I was just thinking about that throughout the week. Cause you know, for all who know, I, I have no problem saying I've been short for the, for about um, two weeks now, like heavily two weeks now. And it's been a terrible trade. And, you know, it's really started from, or I've really started to think about why it's become a terrible trade. Um, and, you know, ultimately I'm still comfortable with my shorts. I still feel like the market will eventually correct and I'll get my chance to, to cover. It may not be for the profit that I had expected before, but I really thought to myself, it, did I make a mistake thinking that I could value growth properly? And in a time where growth seems to be very segmented, but at the same time, it's also, in some cases accelerated to levels that we've never seen before. So for the software sector, um, you know, I've talked about uh, this before that not every company is going to be an Amazon, even though the growth rates signal that, you know, there's this hyper growth, things are growing um, 50, 60% because we've had this technology compression due to COVID. And so in that case, when you have growth being taken away almost instantly from uh, sectors like the hospitality sector, airline sector, different things and the places to put your money in become very thin. How can we exactly value something that's actually seeing enormous acceleration in, in profitability, earnings and adoption? Um, so it, it really begged the question, is there a need to kind of take everything off the table as far as how we evaluate stocks beforehand and, and kind of put, put together a new standard on, on how, growth stocks trade, how the market values growth, especially um, technology growth, where you have companies that have 70, 80% gross margins growing, um, you know, earnings 60, 80% with, with triple digit revenue growth. And, and while the stock prices have gone through the roof, um, it seems like value or I'm sorry, growth is somewhat limitless until we get the first signs of warning. And uh, just, just for an example, as we saw this week, Fastly, one of the best um, uh, high growth stocks over the past two months, it's a great company, great, pro um, great product. And I think it, it definitely has a future in, 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 this, uh, in this world. They saw a 30% decline um, due to the fact that they had missed earnings guidance by 5 million. And you know that that's a very key thing because this company makes $350 million a year in revenue and to miss on 5 million seems like no big deal, especially considering the stock had dropped 30%. But that seems to be just the, the, the attitude that we are in as far as how we're evaluating future growth. It's more so about buy now and worry later versus, you know, oh, maybe the expectations could, could temper off and, and market discounting could, could eventually start. No, it, it just seems like... Um, these stocks will continue to uh, be bought because growth is very scarce. And, and specifically, this growth is very unique compared to any other time in history. And 
you know, it's all great until you get that first warning sign. And even if it's not that big of a warning sign, like we saw with Fastly's 5 million miss, it could lead to disastrous results, like a a 40%, 30% drop in a week. So, you know, that's, that seems to me how this whole attitude towards growth stocks is going, at least for now, I think, um, this week was very critical. I, I already outlined it in my uh, video beforehand, but um, we'll see if that continues. If we start to see a, a major pullback with all growth stocks, then you know this this talk of normalization could be in threat. But as long as growth stocks continue to go up for the majority, because you didn't see a thirty percent drop in in growth stocks like uh, Peloton or MongoDB, they may have gone. I think they actually went up this week overall. So you didn't see that overall bubble pop like I I thought we would. Um, so once again, this yeah. could be just an individual stock basis that you buy now and you wait and see. And at the first sign of trouble, it could just be a huge volatile crash. So that that's yeah. just the risk. I mean, one thing I definitely agree with you is volatility in, in some of these growth stocks is very heightened. You know, and and the craziest thing is, and you discussed this in a in a previous post, which is it's not really even being factored into the VIX, right? We're yeah. seeing heightened volatility in some of these stocks where, like you sh- just illustrated, you know, Peloton had a 30% drop literally overnight. Um, oh, who's to say, I'm sorry? <laughs> I think you said Peloton Fastly. Fastly had 30% drop. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, Fastly had a 30% drop, uh, you know, literally overnight. You know, who's to say that after you have some earnings misses or, you know, something happens um, in, in terms of bad news or the market overall pulls back, you might start seeing that kind of drop. Now, to play devil's advocate, you know, one could make the argument that trying to time the this quote unquote bubble that we're seeing develop, trying to time the top of that is almost, you know, capital suicide, right? It's trading suicide because nothing in terms of uh, monetary policy from the Fed has changed. The market sentiment, even though I personally believe it's, it's very bullish, last week when we had our guest, Austin, I framed the question in a way where I said, the Fed has effectively created a a Tina, there is no alternative environment where bonds are not yielding. Other countries are not really seeing growth in their bonds or their uh, equity markets or their respective equity markets. And so the United States having these massive companies and an economy that can actually sustain this kind of quote unquote printing that we're doing, the money from the world that is on the sidelines waiting to be put in is probably being put into the one market in the world that has literally shown us that there's strength in here still. And that's the United States equity market. So to me, when I look at the stock market from that kind of perspective, it makes me kind of humble myself and realize I don't even know how much money there is waiting to dive into this market and buy every single pullback, whether it's Apple, which is a company that's trading at 45 times earnings, $2.3 trillion market cap, has not really even had that much major growth recently. Yet, I would not be surprised if every 10, 20% pullback gets bought up and we never see Apple come back, you know, 40 or 50% drops from here. That's fair. That's fair to assume unless you have an individual crisis, like let's just say for Apple's case, if they miss on iPhone uh, estimates and people do not upgrade as, as much as analysts are expecting, then I think you'll see a little bit of what we saw in Fastly, probably not to the same degree because Apple has a lot more institutional ownership and they, they'll hold that price up a little bit better, but you'll see those big drops. It could drop 10% in a day as a result of that. And, and uh, uh, that's not out of the ballpark. I will uh-huh. say though, um, as far as the Tina is concerned, I agree with you for the most part. Like it just seems like there are not many places to put your money into. But one area I would not discount, and this continues to be the area where I see the best economic data is China. China continuously, I think they're back to now 100% manufacturing capacity. They are on a roll. And they were Mm -hmm. the ones that were leading the recovery at the beginning of of this recession. And and so far, I think they're ahead as far as global productivity and getting back to where they were pre-COVID they're ahead of of every other um, large economy, especially the US where we still have um, some some, uh, cases of lockdown or or restricted, you know, definitely there's still a ton of restrictions on on small businesses. But, uh, you know, I would definitely say China is a place that I could see huge, huge amount of investment inflow 
um, come into over the next year or so, two years as other economies, especially if our economy continues to struggle to get back to pre-COVID levels. Yeah, and I'm glad you brought up China because <clears throat> it, it seems like the, the political atmosphere that we've created for the last two years um, from the standpoint of the United States, and to be fair, I think you know, China has done its fair share in escalating some tensions as well. What we've seen from the US is almost an, a slightly more aggressive posture towards China, whether it be on the trading front, whether it be uh, you know, from import export front. And lately, of course, we've seen the whole bite dance, you know, TikTok uh, fiasco that's been going on. And you were the one who actually told me that ByteDance owns Fastly. And that to oh, me, TikTok. I was like, oh, uh, ByteDance owns TikTok. Wait, yeah. I'm sorry. Is Fastly owned by, um, is Fastly owned by uh, ByteDance? No, but TikTok is Fastly's biggest um, customer. So when, when effectively ByteDance got banned, that put pressure on Fastly, I think, on that day because... Uh, um, you know, TikTok is, is Fastly's biggest customer. And so the risk of that kind of evaporating or, or, or lowering in any way, I think also put, a, put an effect on Fastly stock price. Gotcha. So where I'm kind of going with this point is, you know, th there seems to be a, a divide, a bifurcation, a, you know, a choosing of teams, if you will. It's the American team, uh, which supposedly is supposed to be the good team. And then there's the Chinese team, which is, you know, the bad guys, you know, communists, et cetera. Um, and I think America is itself, you know, taking that kind of hard stance. Even Trump in his tweets, uh, maybe a couple of days ago, he said that, you know, we will be completely uh, non-reliant on China, in, you know, by the time like he's done with his, you know, next uh, term of presidency, something like that. Um, and so the point of all this is we are now coming to a, uh, an environment in, in macro um, economics, if you will, that it's either you have money pushed into American stocks, American equities, or like you said, Chinese markets are actually doing relatively well. And, uh, you know, the money flows there, but America is also kind of taking a hardened stance of, we want to start pulling back supply chains back from China, we want to, you know, make sure that if you have, you know, some relative connection with Chinese companies or tri Chinese trading firms, anything, you know, they want to sever those ties. So do you think that going forward, you know, it would be wise for investors to be looking at Chinese stocks as, you know, um, fire sale stocks that we should be getting into? Or do you think that we should generally just be staying away? I think there are some, like, I think it's, it's kind of a case by case base. I think China itself has, has a lot of catching up to do as far as getting their entire population uh, either integrated to internet internet products or more technologically integrated. I think, I don't know the exact data of how much is urban versus rural or something, but you know, the, the growth is still, is still there for the taking. So stocks like Alibaba, JD.com, PDD, uh, EDU is an online educational company. Internet products in, in China, I think will continue to see massive growth. And I think their runway um, just based on that could be two to three down, Two to three years of really good growth and and how the market and investors really value that growth it remains to be seen if it if it's something like what we've seen over the past year or so these stocks could definitely go up 200 300 percent from where they are now in in a short amount of time um but once again i'm not an expert on chinese uh on chinese affairs or or, or the economy in itself i'm just speaking purely on just kind of theory and logic. So it, I would definitely do a case by case base, but just in my opinion, there's a lot to be had for the internet companies. And I think they'll see their stock prices like explode. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of, um, I kind of have been taking a look at Chinese stocks and, you know, they, they definitely seem appealing. I think the one thing that really paranoids me is, you know, this kind of global tension, especially when it comes to politics, it's not something that I feel like betting against because you don't really know um, the you don't really know the extent to which politicians will take this kind of uh, rhetoric to you know maybe ban Chinese companies or stop foreign investment or any of that. Um, so I just figured I'd just pose that question to you. Um, yeah, I, th I think it's smart. It, it's it's a smart question, but I'm not going to act like I, I know where things are going to be headed because i think we're still tied we're in terms of technology supply chain 
Um, there's a lot of factors that I think will keep the nationalization um, talk at, at ease. And especially if we get, uh, you know, as, as the election comes and goes and, and people can get back to normal and, you know, politicians don't have to talk against China in order to gain votes, I think um, tension will, tensions will probably lower and hopefully go back to, to somewhat normal. But I still want like, you know, as an American, I still want jobs to come back to the U.S. because I think that's there's definitely been a lot of uh, manufacturing jobs that are in China that could definitely come back over here, especially since we're in an unemployment crisis. So we'll totally see agree. how that plays out. So that's yeah, all I yeah, I totally, yeah, I totally agree with that. Um, let, let's pivot back to you know the the U.S. stocks and let's go back to our conversation with you know growth versus value because there's a question that that a couple of our viewers posed, which is financial uh, industrials, right? Underperforming sectors for almost a decade. Why do they matter? And why should we pay attention to them? That's a great question. But I, I like industrials. No, you got to put them in in the winners category. It's pretty much the losers have been energy and financials. And I really like industrials for the most part. I've talked about this before. There seems to be a lot of bipartisan support to get a big infrastructure bill done within, you know, by 2022 latest. Uh, you're going to see a ton of these companies like URI, Caterpillar. They're going to see orders out the wazoo. And not only that, even in terms of manufacturing, automation is continuously getting better and better. And, and more of these companies are going to choose to either increase operating efficiency through these automated solutions. There's a lot of runway for technology to lower a ton of the costs in the industrial sector. Um, so I'm really, I'm actually really positive on, on industrials in general. You have a lower dollar. Um, you know, as money has been pumped in, the, the dollar will probably remain low or at a relatively lower level than it was before. That's mm-hmm. going to help a lot of these international industrials. So I'm very high on the industrial sector. I, I think industrials have a lot of runway in terms of operating efficiency um, going up. And, and for the most part, it looks like they're going to get money from, from politics, especially if this labor market recovery sort of slows down a bit and, and we need to find more labor growth in other sectors. I think the industrial sector is the, the solution. But uh, as far as value sectors like energy and financials, yeah, it's, you know, financials are being disrupted by fintech players. And, uh, and for the most part, it's, uh, I, I just don't know. I, I talked about it in my video. I'm not really trying to play any financials except for Morgan Stanley. That's literally the only financial I would, I would ever, um, that I would ever touch in the next month, two months, three months, because they've relatively outperformed the rest of the sector, including the super leader like JP Morgan. Um, and they keep killing it on earnings. They keep showing that they are a class above the rest. And mm-hmm. you wouldn't think that because, you know, JP Morgan has been just on fire and Goldman Sachs has been, uh, for the most part, aside from their scandal, they've been doing fairly well. They're growing fairly well. But Morgan Stanley continues to to make mergers and acquisitions and, and increase profitability, whether it's through trading. I don't know how sustainable that is, but... Morgan Stanley is the only one in the financial space that I would do that. So it's it's mainly by case by case in the value sectors. You can still find great great stocks in the value sector, but it's it's becoming increasingly tough, especially when you have um, on the other side, on the growth side, stocks like AYX growing, you know, 30, 40, 50 percent with 90 percent gross margins in in an industry that seems like it only wants to grow more and more and more. It just seems like the risk reward is so much better if, even if you're a long-term player buying a stock that's i think the stock is like 500 600 pe you know the the value of that technology at least in this market seems to be worth more than um the discount that these banks or these energy stocks are trading at and energy just to touch on that briefly i'm not a fan of energy i think the movements that we've seen in solar stocks like sedg and phase we talked about it a little bit last week in in the sunday's video I think that's an indictment on the energy sector in the long run. And, and even though there's probably some volatility and hype in these stocks right now, like I don't think they're going to be um, trading at these prices within a month or two months. You know, it, it goes to show you that at least the plans for, for becoming more renewable based is set in stone. And we it may be accelerated if we get, you know, a full democratic sweep. So I'm not high on the energy sector. I agree. There's really no point in paying for it. I think this is another case in the financials and energy where the cheap will get cheaper. Um, and if you're looking for generational buys, you know, the, the absolute bargain basement buys, I think you're, you're probably another bad down cycle away 
from that. Yeah, um, I'm glad you brought up the the energy part because I, I truly believe that we're we're doing our best to kind of get away from energy, and I think uh, the the recent COVID shock um, has kind of also put in some at least some nail in the coffin on energy. It's getting increasingly hard to fight the argument that solar when altern alternative energies are not going to start taking massive chunks out of the market cap of these uh, you know, traditional energy sectors, right? Traditional energy companies. I was just reading the other day that you know, there were some analysts from all these different uh, research firms and hedge funds uh, that were doing energy research and a lot of them just started leaving. They didn't really have research to produce or they didn't really care much. And they said that there's much more opportunities either in solar or either in you know, other sectors. And that to me is, is a sign of you know, changing of the tide or the times are shifting. And I could not see a better time to change everything after now that coronavirus has completely changed the world. So this again goes back to our original point that we opened with is how has this, this new reality you know, been shaped are we in a new paradigm? And if so, how do we, how do we um, grapple with it? And I think you kind of uh, nail the point, which is, well, we got to start looking at these new sectors that are coming up, uh, subsectors, if you will, that are coming up. And specifically, SEDG, which was one of the stocks that you had mentioned last week in the video, and N phase, which was another one, right? Uh, EMPH, yeah. I've been, yeah. I've been high on these two um, for a long time. I forgot, I always forget which one is a residential solar player and which one's the commercial res, res, or the commercial uh, res, or blah, the commercial solar player. But uh, just do your work on both of them because both of them have amazing margins. They're looking like they're killing it in their businesses. And as these costs go down, you know, the, the sky's the limit for um, that, that for that uh, market to open up, you know, as, as your prices go down, demand will, will seemingly go up because it's cheaper now. And at a certain point, when it gets to a certain level of cheapness, you're going to see the average consumer have enough money to, to fully um, be on solar power for their business or their home. And, and it's an exciting time. I, I hope it happens soon. Yeah, that's a great point. The other point I want to talk about is Tesla. You know, still relatively one of the more hotter topics, hotter stocks that are still out there. Um, you know, what, what are your thoughts? Like, what do you think about Tesla? Well, I'm still short this puppy. Um, so naturally, I think, first of all, I think on battery day, I was really, I was really surprised to hear them talk about the lithium um, problem so, so candidly. And I thought it would be something that, that, most of these electric car companies would want to avoid um, as far as lithium scarcity and, and everything relating to the demand of lithium, or I'm sorry, not the demand, but the supply of lithium, at least in two to three years is when they expect, you know, supply to be a little bit harder to reach. But it just goes to show you Tesla, I think, is thinking of, you know, the, the problems down five to 10 years versus every other electric car company um, which is thinking about how to become Tesla as a car company. It's, you know, Tesla's in the energy solution business. And I continued, I was like very impressed with, with how they went about uh, that battery day. So I'm ultimately, I'm a long-term guy. I think, I think long-term, this stock is still fine. If you're a long-term uh, uh, investor in Tesla, you should feel good about it. And I think they're still, it seem like they're at the forefront of solving the core issues that, will plague this industry, I think, in the next four to five years. It will become very tough for, for all these other players to figure out. But, um, you know, short term, I'm still negative on Tesla. I think this stock could come down to around uh, maybe 300, 325 before it, it starts to find a good amount of buyers. But, uh, yeah, it, it just it's all moving in the growth space. If you see other growth leaders start to sell off, I think you're going to see Tesla sell off. I don't think there's any additional catalyst that hasn't already been priced in um, that'll be able to push the stock up to, to all-time highs unless you get that second move in the entire growth space um, you know, as uh, in unison. Yeah, I, you know, I, I took a um, small uh, short-term Tesla position, long position, and I got in around like 445 or so. I was aiming for 500, so just you know, quick move. 
Um, what is that like three or four percent move or something? Oh no, I'm sorry, that's an eight percent move, right? So one of the reasons um, I don't see Tesla valued anywhere close to where it is right now, like I see Tesla's realized valuation, you know, a bit closer to half of where it is right now. Whoa. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll list a couple of reasons and, you know, maybe we can go back and forth on it. Um, all right. So Tesla right now is trading as a company with, you know, about 500,000 or 500,000 cars of sales per year, generally. Okay. Um, it's trading as the most expensive stock, the most expensive company by market cap in the world in terms of auto. Okay, yet not even having anywhere close to the same number of auto sales, right? I think number one is Toyota. Mm -hmm. um, we can make the argument that Tesla is trading at a valuation because it is projecting out into the future that it will be the dominant player in a space um, where other industries may not even be able to come up. For example, you and I had a conversation about, you know, there might be um, some auto, like like uh, FSD, like full self-driving car insurance that might develop at some point through Tesla. So then you can make the argument that, okay, Tesla can then be the front runner on this FSD insurance space. That again, can add a layer to their market cap. Okay, fair enough. They are also the leader in terms of full self-driving cars because no one really comes anywhere close. The great thing about Tesla is because there's, you know, close to about 400 to $500,000 a year, uh, 500 cars a year, they get to collect all this data and then they get to approach that data from the standpoint of how can we start improving and, you know, um, working towards our uh, self-automating, you know, driving cars and, you know, how can we get to that goal faster and better? And no other company clo comes anywhere close to that. So you, again, you know, that can add another layer to the segment, which is if they start cracking the code of having their cars be the first fully automated, you know, self-driving cars. Okay. There's not anyone close in that field either. But still, that begs the question, should it be trading, you know, what is it, 1,200 times, you know, forward earnings, like 12-month forward earnings at present moment? It just doesn't make any sense to me because, like, no single metric, if unless you go out, like, 10 years from now, like, I heard the best parallel. Tesla is trading right now as Amazon is right now, you know, say 10 years ago. So for example, Amazon being traded at a $2 trillion or $1.5 trillion market cap. Imagine if Amazon was trading at this price, at this market cap 10 years ago, you would say that's fucking nuts. Like what is Amazon, you know, going to do? Yes, it could do all these amazing things 10 years from now, but it's literally doing that sort of, you know, um, uh, pricing in the stock 10 years earlier, which wouldn't make any sense. Oh, I guess, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I agree with a lot of what you're saying as far as, sure, they have the avenues of growth. Um, seemingly, you know, people can think about it like the insurance or, or the other aspects like AI driving as, oh, they're locked in to, to do that at some point. But, uh, you know, the, their brand, I guess, is, is just so strong. Um, at least in the U.S., it, it continues to be very, very strong. I think the only other car that I hear people wanting to get as far as an electric vehicle is like the BMW convertible, but no, other than that, that's like it. And Tesla seems to have a lock as far as um, if you want an electric car, this is what you're going to buy. And, you know, that, that type of brand power, I think people over the years and, and over the, over the past have seen what that brand power does. I think this brand power had like in, in Apple's case, Apple had brand power in 2008, 2009, and, you know, for the people that bought it that, at, at that point, you know, that they're sitting very happy. The power of, or I'm sorry, the value of that brand, I think, has been elevated, whether a brand can be extended through social media or, or different aspects. People love Elon Musk, um, mm -hmm. you know, in just a broad sense, people do like it. So I think there's a lot of that in that stock. And, and once again, it's, it's always going to have a floor as a result of that. I think it'll always be expensive. It'll never be a fairly traded company. 
um, because yeah. of those reasons that I mentioned. But for the most part, I agree with you. Short term, it just seems like a lot of optimism is priced in. But when you look at the landscape of, of the market, you know, you're seeing commonalities in, in a lot of other industries too, whether it's the software sector or, or anything else. So there's a lot going for it. And, and also clean energy seems to be, um, clean energy solution seems to be something that's that's on a roll too. So you have all these different momentum factors playing in. I agree with you. I think it's short term over, definitely overhyped, but uh, I, I can, I, I won't be surprised if that stock comes down to 300 you know, still trading at a at a very expensive premium, but continues to to continue its long term trend. Fair point. Um, any other topics that you want to talk about? Uh, da, da, da. Uh, I think just um, no. Actually, I'm good. I'm I'm good. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we'll cover um uh the dollar and the uh, bonds real quick just to give a quick recap. So, you know, again, some of these levels that we had mentioned price has been quite well respecting it. Um, this was the previous channel, well, not the channel, but rather, you know, sideways trading range that we had where price had caught support way back in 2018. And as we drew that, um, we pointed this out to our members right around the end of September, we kind of tapped that perfectly and rolled over. Uh, the other level that I'm watching and the uh, Dixie right here is this level down here where we caught a bunch of support, which allowed us to propel up higher. Um, you know, again, it's very hard to make an argument uh, that DXY is, you know, the perfectly technical traded asset because it's really not, it's, it's a basket of currencies. So you can technically look at, you know, dollar yen, dollar euro, um, you know, many other basket basket of currencies in the DXY. And then of course the external news flow that goes along to move the dollar back and forth that could quite well easily, you know, um, redefine, you know, technicals literally like, you know, in a span of hours. Uh, but the reason we look at technicals is to just give us a general understanding of levels that we should be watching. And I think at present moment, what I'm recognizing in the dollar is, you know, th there's a large sort of base being created, you know, it's not, continuously going down that's for sure you know since um the the march high that we had it had continuously rolled over further and further and you know now we've had a good two and a half three month base created here so i'm thinking that we're probably going to trade in this range for a little while and what that in my opinion allows us to do is i think um the, the stock market will be able to be a little bit um more range bound as well as a DXY trades in this range. And if anything, you can make the argument that the stock market has an easier ability to break out. Same thing with crypto, because the dollar, in my opinion, I don't think is just going to start taking off um, up from here. Uh, 10 year, you know, again, bonds are really not indicating anything, um, just a whole lot of sideways chop. And there's an important point that I noted from uh, Ben Inker, who is uh, one of the head uh, asset allocators from GMO, which is the, uh, it's a hedge fund um, run by Jeremy Grantham. He's, you know, very, very famous investor. Basically what the bond markets um, and, you know, even financials are kind of showing us is that um, at least financials, they're being priced at levels below the, the valuations of 2009. And if you start looking at bonds and you start looking at financials, you know, it kind of begs the question that if all is so well in the world, if all is so well in the U.S. economy, why are banks priced so poorly? Um, one of the arguments that we can make is that because of so much heavy central bank intervention, banks are just not able to trade at proper valuations because there's not a whole lot of money that's going through banks at present moment. Right. It's not like, you know, banks are trying to, um, I don't know, uh, fend off a lot of insolvencies because, again, the Fed has kind of stepped up to the plate and they've said that, OK, we got your back. You know, small businesses, medium sized businesses, corporate bonds, they've kind of come into the play and taken the role of what some of these banks would have done. And so what you're effectively seeing is not a whole lot of utility by banks. So again, this was his position, his posture. Um, and, you know, I think bonds are kind of reflecting that 
well, people aren't out there buying bonds. And this again goes back to last week's discussion, which was, um, you know, maybe the Fed has sort of created this, this monster, this environment where maybe bonds and, you know, treasury yields may not be where the real money flows. You know, and in fact, it might be the U.S. stock market. It might be, you know, new emerging assets. We don't really know, but we're going to take it one step at a time. Yeah, I think that's a great, great way to put it. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Fassel, for joining us. Again, I think it was a very healthy discussion. I hope our viewers get a lot to take away from that. Um, again, oh, if y'all... I, I did want to ahead. clarify. I think I misspoke earlier about <laughs> about when I was talking about the branding um, and about you know when to buy a Tesla or something like that. I just want to make clear. I think I said, if you bought it, Apple, in 2009... Um, you know, for the people that are, are thinking about, they bought Apple because it was a great brand in 2009. I'm that was like a drop. That's not a good comparison. I want to talk about if you bought Apple um, at the peak of 2000, which was the the tech bubble. Apple had mm -hmm. some form of brand in the PC market. They, obviously, it wasn't the same dominant brand, but it was still a very good brand. And and the fact that they were able to build an ecosystem off their brand, whether it was um, having the app store, having uh, now Apple music, just different parts of that. I think Tesla, people see Tesla like that in the same way. So even though they've seen this huge spike, um, in, in Tesla in, in near-term valuation, once again, it could pay off just like an Apple, which, um, after stock, uh, stock splits and everything, it was, it would actually be at $1 around $1 at the peak of 2000. Yeah. At the peak of the 2000 bubble. So, wow. You know, it's, it, I mean, that goes to show you, if you do buy brand, it has paid off. And I think people have learned from that lesson. And, and you know, I just wanted to clarify that because I, I realized that that was not a, a, an accurate thing. So I just wanted to get, get that off my chest. Yeah, uh, that's a great point. And, you know, something that our viewers should definitely look into. Um, I think we had a pretty solid discussion, a lot of actionable points to take away for our viewers. Again, if you guys are interested in, uh, joining our Advantage membership where you see um, all these locked channels, whether it's the equity side that Basil pays a lot of attention in and provides a lot of updates. He also has a stock alerts channel. Again, we don't provide financial advice. Uh, we have an option side. And then of course, the crypto side is also very heavily populated with conversation, lots of information. You can go to our website, sign up um, on the products page right here for the Advantage membership. And for $97 a month, you get access to everything, every single lock channel, as you can see. Okay, so I hope you all come join. Hit the thumbs up on the video. And again, until then, see you next week. Cheers. Peace.